Howdy, folks. Welcome to the August edition of Cattle Trail Showcase. I'm Norm Wilson, Poet Lariat. Mighty glad to be your host. Today, we are zooming along the Chisholm Trail to Waco, Texas, to the, the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame and Museum. And this is going to be fun. Uh, the purpose of the Cattle Trail Showcase is to continually highlight the community's historical elements, museums, and other attractions along the Chisholm and the Western Cattle Trail. This showcase is brought to you by the International Chisholm Trail Association, of which Dennis Katzenmeyer is president, Michael Grauer is vice president, Nancy Lawrence is secretary, and Mary Lou Rivers is our treasurer. Lonnie Steven is our showcase chair. The term Texas Ranger is legendary, and it's real. Two centuries worth of fascinating history. Today, we're going to hear from Audrey Lett, who is the Education Programs Manager at the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, she's served in that position since 2018, the native of the Houston area, earned her BA in history from the University of North Texas, an MA in Museum Studies from Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis, UIPUI. Before coming to the Texas Ranger Museum, Audrey worked at institutions such as the San Jacinto Museum of History in Port, Texas, the Indianapolis Zoo and the Idle Jordan Museum of American Indians and Western Art in Indianapolis. And now she is at the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame and Museum. So uh, Audrey, the floor is yours. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen here in a moment. Um, and when I do that, I'll probably turn my camera off and then I'll turn it back on when we're done for any questions any of you have. All right, let's get started. All right. Perfect. Great. So as um, you may know, it is the 200th anniversary for the Texas Rangers. Um, and because there is so much uh, history to talk about, we like to divide it up into six sections uh, to make it a little easier to uh, digest. And so starting with, of course, the ranging tradition, 1823 to 1836. So the Rangers were founded by Stephen F. Austin. Uh, when Austin brought his original 300 American families to come settle in Texas, they quickly figured out that they had a little bit of a security problem, both with just general banditry and lawlessness and also with raiding Native American tribes. Which, to give the Native Americans credit, if someone came into my house and tried to kick me out, I'd probably be a little irritated about it too. But with all history, there are multiple viewpoints, and we are telling the story from the ranger point of view today. So due to those security concerns, Austin wrote to Mexico City and got permission to create the very first Texas Rangers. The quote from the letter he wrote is that he wanted 10 men to range the frontier. So these original 10 men, and that was only 10 for the entire frontier of Texas, um, served under Lieutenant Moses Morrison, and they were all volunteers. Um, if they were paid at all in the early days, they would have been paid in land and not money. Uh, Texas has always been very big, but was not very wealthy during this time. Uh, the volunteers had to be at the beginning unmarried men, and they also had to bring all of their own supplies. So that would have included single shot guns, knives, camp gear, and a horse. And it was actually written in the rules that it had to be a good horse, not a bad horse. It had to be a reliable horse. Um, and as uh, time went on and Texas became an independent republic, Sam Houston, the first president, decided to continue the ranging tradition. Which brings us to our next section, Defending the Frontier, 1837, to 1870. So after Texas became a republic, um, for the most part, the rangers continued to do the job they had been doing, uh, riding up and down the frontier, protecting colonists from Native American tribes like the Comanche, but also um, leftover tensions from the Revolutionary War, protecting them against Mexican forces as well. Uh, but it wasn't all a negative relationship between those three groups. In fact, there were quite a few um, Hispanic and Mexican Rangers, as well as Native American Rangers. We even know of two Lipan Apache captains of their own Ranger companies, and their names were Castro and Flaco, and at least one Hispanic Ranger captain named Captain Manchaca. Now, believe it or not, um, 
in the early days, the Rangers were actually at a little bit of a disadvantage to Native American tribes like the Comanche because of the technology that they were working with. The Rangers uh, had single shot guns. And while that first bullet could do a lot of damage, after they fired it, they had to reload. And reloading could take anywhere from a minute to a minute and a half if you were good at it, during which an average Comanche warrior could fire anywhere from six to 12 arrows while the Rangers were essentially sitting ducks. Not to mention to reload their firearm, the Rangers had to get off of their horses. And Native American tribes, specifically the Comanche, were considered some of the best light cavalry fighters in the world and could use all of their weaponry from horseback. So at the beginning, Rangers often lost more battles than they won, again, due to that technology. But all of this began to change when Samuel Colt created the first viable revolver, which is the Colt Patterson. And then on the screen is the one at the blue background. So uh, the Colt Patterson um, shot five bullets before a Ranger had to reload, which as you can imagine is a pretty big deal in a battle. If a Ranger went into battle with two guns, they now went from two bullets to 10 before ever needing to reload. And Captain Jack Coffee Hayes, he's a pretty famous Ranger captain from the 1830s. He was the person that convinced the Texas government to let him arm his Rangers with those Pattersons. And it really served as a turning point for the Rangers winning more and more battles. And although there are a lot of fantastic things about the Patterson, there are some problems as well. Um, the first one being, if you look at that uh, gun on the blue background, it does not have a visible trigger or trigger guard. That's because the ranger actually had to cock the gun and pull the hammer all the way back, and only then would the trigger pop down. The problem with this is without a trigger guard, there is a chance of accidentally firing your weapon, which could, you know, cause some problems, especially in the 1800s. The other drawback to the Patterson is it came apart into five different pieces. Uh, every time you had to reload, and one of those pieces was about the size, a uh, little thicker than a nickel. It was pretty tiny. And if you didn't put those pieces back together correctly, your gun was not going to function. So because of some of the benefits and the drawbacks, another ranger captain named Sam Walker wrote to, sorry, yeah, wrote to Sam Colt, and they worked together to create the Colt Walker. Uh, and there are a lot of improvements over the Patterson. If you look at the uh, firearm with the wood background, you can see it now has a resting trigger and a trigger guard. It also shoots a larger bullet and uh, it is a six shooter. So if you are a fan of Western and uh, Western movies, this is the proverbial original Western six shooter. But unlike some of those wonderful Western movies where you have um, let's say John Wayne uh, stepping back 10 paces and quick drawing from his waist. The walker weighed five pounds fully loaded. So for the most part, rangers actually carried these heavy guns and holsters on their horses' saddles. That way it's right there if they need them, but they're not having to attempt to carry 10 pounds of weight on their gun belts. It wasn't until the 1870s when they're getting into the single action army which is a much smaller six shooter that they were able to comfortably carry them on their uh, gun belt. But the benefit of the Walker is that it is the most powerful gun of its kind for almost 100 years. So that five pounds of weight really packed a punch. Which brings us to our next section, Enforcing the Law, 1874 to 1900. So at this point, a lot has happened in wider Texas history. Um, the Texas, Texas joined the United States, the Civil War happened, they rejoined the United States, and everything going on nationwide is affecting how the Rangers are doing their job. So at this point, getting into the 1870s, um, many of the Native Americans that caused the Rangers a lot of problems were now being put onto reservations. So um, a huge reason the Rangers were created was no longer a thing. A law was passed in 1874 that started transitioning the rangers from frontier fighters into frontier law enforcement. So they're still stationed on the frontier, that's still where they're needed, but now instead of you know, defending the colonists in sort of a military way, they're investigating crimes like 
uh, cattle rustling, horse thieving, train robberies, and also um, a few murders as well. This is also the very first time that the Rangers are organized into companies or battalions, which is still the organizational structure that they use today. A couple of the important people from this specific time period. The first one, we have Major John B. Jones, that very impressive mustache up there. Uh, he was the leader of the Frontier Battalion, and he's credited with bringing a lot of structure and quote, quote, modernization for the 1870s um, to the Rangers. He expected them to start dressing nicer, to be a little bit more clean shaven. He wanted them to look like professional peace officers rather than rugged mountain men. And if you look at the picture on the screen, you can see many of those men are dressed in uh, nice vests, button up shirts. They have ties of some sort on. Um, and he also expected them to keep records of what they were doing, where they were doing it, and of course, how they were spending the state's money. Now, a couple on the other end of that spectrum, we have Captain Leander McNelly. Uh, McNelly led the border company, and some accounts describe him as being a little too aggressive. Um, he would often just follow bandits right over the border into Mexican soil and get into gunfights in Mexico. The problem with this, of course, is he had no jurisdiction or power to be doing any of this in the country of Mexico. So once both nations kind of caught wind of what was going on, he was politely asked, but firmly, to cut it out. One riot, one ranger. There's not many slogans that kind of sum up the mythology of the Texas Rangers quite like one riot, one ranger. There are a couple different ideas where this phrase comes from. Uh, but the one we're going to talk about today is about Captain Bill McDonald. Captain McDonald is considered one of the four great captains of this time period. And the legend goes that he was called into a small Texas town to help stop a riot. And when he got off the train in the town, the mayor looked at him and he's like, I have an entire riot here. Where are the rest of your men? And supposedly McDonald responded, you only have one riot. You only need one ranger. And while that is a fantastic story that I genuinely love to tell, when we look at the history, it doesn't always quite end up that way. So for example, um, in 1896, boxing matches were actually illegal in the state of Texas. You couldn't have one. Uh, but there are gonna be two uh, pri kind of prize fighters in the area and they wanted to have a fight in Texas. So they picked an island in the middle of the Rio Grande that was not in Mexico and not in America and had the fight there. And the Texas town across from that little island was a little nervous that things could go wrong. That, you know, if someone, the wrong person won or lost the fight, there could be violence, a riot could break out. So they asked the Rangers to come in and just keep the peace. And not just one or two Rangers showed up, but that entire group of Rangers you can see on your screen, including four captains and the Adjutant General of Texas. Now, they did their job incredibly. The, the prize fight went off without a hitch. There were no problems. Everything was nice and peaceful. Um, but as you can see, the history doesn't always exactly match up with those legends. Now, I'm not entirely sure why they all decided to go, but my personal opinion is they all wanted to see that boxing match. Though I will uh, acknowledge that is just my personal opinion. <laughs> All right, our next section is Order Out of Chaos, 1901 to 1934. So by this point, um, the Rangers are pretty much statewide. Uh, they're no longer kind of relegated off to the frontier. That's definitely less of a thing when you're getting into the 19 teens and 20s. Um, but of course, once again, everything going on nationwide changes how the Rangers are doing their job, starting with oil boomtowns. So when you get into um, the 20th century, more and more people are able to buy cars. And with more people buying cars, you need more oil. And oftentimes in Texas, oil was discovered in these tiny, tiny little East Texas towns. Um, sometimes had uh, like 2,000 people in them. And when oil is discovered, of course, everyone comes to that town because you can get a job, you can make money, you can set up a business. And sometimes in the matter of a few weeks, that town can explode from 2,000 to 30,000 people. And that local sheriff was, was probably fantastic at keeping up with 2,000 people, but out of their element when you get to 30,000. So a lot of times oil boom towns would become very dangerous places to live. 
And when things got too bad, they would call in the Texas Rangers. And the Rangers would ride in, clean up the town, and be on their way. The reason this kept the Rangers pretty busy, though, is a lot of times they'd go in, clean up a town, leave, and then be called in two months later to do it all over again. Another thing that kept the Rangers busy, busy during the early 1900s was prohibition. So when uh, the United States made it illegal to make or sell alcohol, except for medicinal reasons, as you can imagine, a lot of people didn't quite like that rule and continue to do all of these things illegally. So the Texas Rangers would often team up with federal agents like the U.S. Marshals to find and put a stop to illegal stills, um, gambling halls, speakeasies, and bootleggers. You can see a whole stash of confiscated alcohol on your screen with a bunch of Rangers standing behind it. One of the more um, famous rangers from this particular time period is Manuel T. Gonzalez, also known as Lone Wolf Gonzalez. And he was famous for, I'm sure you can guess by the nickname, pursuing um, bootleggers, drug runners, and gamblers all on his own very successfully. I'm sure many of you have probably heard of Bonnie and Clyde. Um, and they were criminals running around in the 1930s in North Texas and other southern states. Um, and they gained quite a reputation for themselves while they were alive in the 1930s, but became really infamous nationwide when a movie was made about them in the 1960s called Bonnie and Clyde. And believe it or not, that movie is still where the majority of people get their facts about Bonnie and Clyde from. Which is unfortunate because, as you can imagine, a Hollywood movie is not exactly historically accurate. For example, it shows Bonnie and Clyde to be more just of a duo when, in fact, they were part of a slightly larger criminal gang known as the Barrow Gang, named after Clyde Barrow, that had anywhere from about four to six members in it at any given time. The movie also shows them to be kind of Robin Hood esque. So they're stealing from the rich to give to the poor. But in reality, Bonnie and Clyde did not rob big town banks. They robbed small mom and pop type convenience stores. They robbed the local bicycle store at one point. And they definitely were not giving any money away out of the goodness of their hearts. The one thing the movie did get correct was that Bonnie and Clyde were very difficult to catch. And there are a couple different reasons for this. One of them is, um, you can see in that picture there, Clyde sitting on the bumper of a car. He really liked to drive around in Ford Model V8s, which was the fastest normal car you could get your hands on at the time, and definitely way faster than anything a local sheriff deputy would have been driving. So it made it really easy for them to speed away. And to give you an idea of how much Clyde just really liked Ford cars, he actually sat down in the middle of his crime spree and wrote a letter to Mr. Ford saying that every time he steals a car, he tries to make sure it's a Ford, because that's the very best there is. I'm sure that made Mr. Ford feel really warm and fuzzy inside. The other reason that Bonnie and Clyde and the Barrow Gang were difficult to catch is because in that same picture of Clyde, you can see that he is holding a very large gun. He had a little bit of a happy trigger finger. And if they were in the middle of committing a crime and things started going wrong, he would just often open fire um, usually using a Browning automatic rifle or a BAR, which was a very large firearm and again, a lot more bullets per minute than anything a local sheriff deputy would have been carrying. And they did not really care how many people or who they killed with they, it got to that point. Now, as time goes on, uh, they ended up having to break one of their buddies out of jail and that resulted in the death of a jail guard. So um, the proprietor of the jail asked for permission from the Texas governor, Ma Ferguson, to bring back two ex-Texas Rangers named Frank Hamer and Manny Galt. Frank Hamer is pictured there in the center, younger than he was when all of this was going on. Uh, but they started their investigation and investigated for months and months and months before finally getting an inside man in the Barrow gang who knew where Bonnie and Clyde were going to be. So they set up an ambush in Louisiana on May 23rd, 1934, that did put a permanent end to Bonnie and Clyde's crime spree. Another kind of fun factor I think is interesting about Bonnie and Clyde is they often seem to be star-crossed lovers, so to speak. Uh, it's very romantic, it's very tragic, and while they were definitely together, 
um, Bonnie was married to somebody else the entire time she was with Clyde. Um, and he was also in jail. So I think she had a little bit of a type. All right. Moving on to Special Investigations, 1935 to 2010. In 1935, the Texas Department of Public Safety, or DPS, because it's a bit of a mouthful, was founded and the Texas Rangers were made a new a division of DPS. And there were a couple of different reasons why this was. Um, the first one was politics. Um, before this, uh, the Rangers really only answered to the Texas governor. The governor decided who, were, who was a ranger, what laws they enforced, and how they enforced them. And this is fine when the governor is an upstanding citizen, but becomes a little, little bit of a problem when the governor is a criminal, which happened twice right before this with Ma and Pa Ferguson. And to give you an idea of how that criminal element in the Texas government affected the Rangers, Ma, at the very beginning of her second term in office, fired every single Ranger which is part of the reason uh, Frank Hamer and Manny Galt were ex-Texas Rangers when they took down Bonnie and Clyde. So under DPS, uh, there's a lot more stability for the Rangers. They're not gonna get fired every time a new governor is comes in. They're not gonna get, things are gonna radically change. It's a lot more of a stable employment. Um, another thing that DPS helped address was um, some abuses of power that had happened by the Rangers during the 19 teens. Um, one example specifically is when the Mexican Revolution had broken out, um, some of that violence did come over the border into Texas, and the Texas Rangers were sent down to help protect Texans. Um, and many of them did their job exactly as they were supposed to, but unfortunately, some of them did not. Um, they committed some pretty awful atrocities against innocent uh, Mexican and Texas civilians, including the murder of 15 unarmed men. It's awful. Texas government knew there was no excuse for something like that to be happening and needed to take some steps to help ensure something like that stopped happening and didn't happen again. So under DPS, there's more people paying attention to what the Rangers are doing and how they're doing it, a lot more oversight. But it wasn't all negative. Um, under DPS, um, for the first, or really their main focus is major crimes. So the Rangers now, of course, have been statewide for a little while. They've also been paid in actual money for a while, too, now. Um, but they're investigating major crimes like murder, robberies, and assaults. And under DPS, for the first time ever, they have access to a statewide crime lab. So when they're gathering evidence at these scenes, they can send them in to specially trained scientists who can help them draw conclusions about who committed the crime. And the person who actually was given the job to put the crime lab together was Lone Wolf Gonzalez. And he did such a fantastic job that it rivaled the FBI crime lab at the time. Which brings us to our last section. So as I mentioned earlier, the Rangers main focus um, is major crimes. And this is still the case today. So usually the way that works is if let's say a murder happens in a small Texas town and that local sheriff maybe has never investigated a murder in their entire career, um, or just is unsure what to do, they can call in their local Texas Ranger and the Ranger will come in and assist. Sometimes the local law enforcement asks the Ranger to take over the case completely, or sometimes they're just asked to assist with a certain part of it, like interviewing suspects or witnesses. But ultimately it is that local law enforcement's call when to bring in the Rangers. So part of the Ranger's job is making sure they have a really good working relationship with all of those local law enforcement um, officers um, in their area. Now, in 2011, um, there was a shift and there are more duties assigned to what the Texas Rangers do today. Um, and that includes, um, they investigate most police-related shootings in the state of Texas. Um, and they also investigate public corruption and public integrity cases. Uh, so if you have someone in the Texas government who has potentially committed a a crime, the Rangers investigate as a neutral party. They also will help out in um, major disasters, whether that's a natural disaster, like helping out after the aftermath of a hurricane or a tornado, or a man-made one, like a bombing or a mass shooting. Uh, because of the size of those sort of crime scenes, those are technically are typically Texas Ranger cases from the very beginning, because they're the most well-equipped to handle them. 
Now, uh, today they are organized still in companies, A through F, and this just gives the Texas Rangers their area of focus. Um, they aren't like, uh, this is one of the things that makes them different than normal police officers or sheriffs. A Waco PD officer could only arrest someone in the city of Waco. A Texas Ranger has statewide jurisdiction. Um, but their, their companies and assigned counties give them the area that they focus on. All right, a little bit about Ranger badges before I open it up to any questions y'all have. Um, people are, uh, Rangers are pretty famous for their circle star badge that they wear today. But what a lot of people don't know is early Rangers didn't even have badges. All they had was a piece of paper called a warrant of authority that said, hey, this person's a real Texas Ranger. But, you know, Rangers looked at other police uh, agencies and they're like, you can't make those badges. And they made their own. And that's why we have badges that are shaped like everything under the sun that are real Texas Ranger badges, but aren't official in any capacity. They still needed that piece of paper. It wasn't until the Rangers became a part of the Texas Department of Public Safety in 1935 that they were issued their first official badge. And it wasn't until 1962 that they were issued the badge that they carry today, which is the one with the white background. The cool thing about the badge they carry today, though, is every single one of them is made out of a cinco peso Mexican coin, one that is not in circulation anymore, of course, but it does go back to the fact that when the Rangers first started, they did serve under the Mexican flag. A little bit about what it takes to be a Ranger, and then it'll be uh, question time. So the Rangers are some of the most well-respected law enforcement agency in, in the nation. And they travel worldwide to countries like China and Australia to give presentations on how they do their job and trainings. So when filling a Ranger vacancy, they wanna make sure that they're getting the best of the best to continue that good reputation. So to even apply to be a Texas Ranger, you have to have at least eight years in law enforcement, uh, the last four of which have to be with DPS. You have to be currently employed with DPS with a rank of at least Trooper 2, and then you need a minimum of 90 college semester hours or relevant military experience. The applicants go through a background check and, and an entrance exam, and then they take the top scores from that exam and interview them. And from what I've heard, the interview process is pretty intense because, again, they're wanting to get the best of the best. Right now, there are about 170 rangers in companies A through F, along with 24 non-commissioned administrative support, one budget analyst, and one forensic artist. And with that, uh, this is just one more image that I just love for the Bicentennial, because it really shows you how much of a difference 200 years makes in terms of uniform, mode of transportation, and technology available to the rangers. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn back on my camera. And I believe uh, we have some time for any questions that y'all might have. Terrific, Audrey. Uh, we'll give uh, give you a virtual round of applause here. Thanks for a terrific presentation. Well, thank you. Audrey. My pleasure. Uh, how fascinating and informative. Uh, my goodness. Um, so how much of this is displayed at the museum? Tell us some about the museum itself. Uh, yes, of course. Um, so the museum was founded uh, in 1968 and pretty much all of this is covered in the museum, though the modern rangers are a little bit less covered just because it's newer um, and we're not a huge museum. Um, but we do talk a little bit about some of the technology they have and all of that history is represented as well as much more, as you can imagine, there's a lot of history going on in 200 years. Uh, the museum in Waco is open seven days a week from nine to five, and we're only closed Christmas Day, Thanksgiving Day, and New Year's Day. So if you want to come check us out, we would love to have you. We would love to be there at the add it to the bucket list. Let me see if there are questions. How many uh, rangers were like the first year, how many did they go through? You said that they were like sitting ducks. So how many of them did they actually go through? I don't know that exact number. Um, I can, we can figure that out later, but I imagine quite a few of them. I know actually Sam Walker, the ranger that created, uh, helped create the, the Colt Walker. He um, was killed in battle not too long after that. Wow. So it's definitely not a safe job to be in. 
How many are there currently? Uh, there are currently about 170, and that number is set by the Texas legislature. Okay. So are they funded by the state of Texas then? I mean, they're like, it'd be like our KBI, I guess, equivalent in Kansas, probably. Yes, that's exactly what they are. Yeah, they're founded by the, um, they are funded by the state of Texas, and they're considered the top investigators for the state. There was one other comment we visited about before the meeting, the presentation about the flags that they started and they worked on. You might elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so the Texas Rangers have served under five of the six flags of Texas, um, even if it was for just a little while. But um, you have, of course, uh, the Mexican flag uh, for a little while, the French flag, uh, the Texas flag when we were an independent nation for uh, nine years, then the Confederate uh, States of America, and of course, the United States. So um, the Texas Rangers predate Texas. Um, so they have served under quite a few flags, which is always just incredible to me that they've been around that long. Pretty remarkable. Michael Gary, you have your hand up? I do. Um, could you tell us about your funding sources and do you receive state of Texas support at all? So the museum is actually part of the city of Waco. Um, and we do not receive funding from the state of Texas. Um, though their um, Texas Ranger uh, Company F headquarters is literally back behind my office and they do let us borrow Rangers from time to time to do programs and stuff like that. Um, but we are completely city of Waco funded. I'm, I'm sorry, I was a little late. I didn't hear your introduction, but um, I've done, I work at the National Cowboy Museum now and I worked at Panhandle Plains Museum up in Canyon for 100 years before that. Um, I just did an exhibition called Outlaw Man, and I included uh, some ranger material in there, particularly about ranger origins, and I missed that part. Did you talk about um, ranger history in terms of the Spanish compañías volantes, the flying companies, the militia? Or, or oftentimes, I know people say, well, they have to be descended from the ranging companies in the old Northwest United States. Um, did you, I'm sure you addressed that, right? I didn't specifically talk about that because there's a lot of history, but right. the rangers were definitely a combination of a lot of traditions. Um, so the Campanias Volantes, the flying companies, that was a direct inspiration. Um, the rangers from England that had been around for a while, that was another thing that influenced what they did. And then of course they learned all about how to travel through Texas, how to fight in different ways from the um, native tribes in the area as well. So it's really, uh, if you'll pardon the term, a melting pot of all kinds of traditions and skills. One last question, and I don't mean to dominate here, because we're the Chisholm Trail Association, and I may have missed this, but did you talk about them being involved with cattle rustling or livestock theft and so on? Yes, yeah, so when they transitioned in the 1870s from kind of frontier fighters into more of a law enforcement, cattle rustling and horse thieving were one of their main laws breakage that they were a criminal activity that they were investigating. Uh, right. So they had a huge role in that um, and even had specific fancy railroad passes uh, so they didn't have to pay so they could get from parts of Texas uh, as quickly as possible. I know Ira Aiton patrolled out in the panhandle, especially in the XIT area. Um, yes. Can you, talk, um, can you talk about Mr. Ayton? Ayton, Ira Ayton's fantastic. Uh, he's an interesting story. My favorite Ira Ayton story is when he was um, kind of fighting in the fence cutting wars. Um, so when barbed wire fences were put up, that wasn't overly popular um, and violence broke out. And his idea that he uh, submitted to the adjutant general was to plant bombs along the fence line. And if you cut a fence, you know, kind of got blown up. As you can imagine, um, the adjutant general thought there could be a few problems with that plan. <laughs> um, so uh, he was told to pull up all the ones he'd already put down, but it worked because everyone thought there were bombs along the fences. So that significantly cut down on fence cutting. That's my favorite Ira Aiden story. Ron, I think Dorothy had a question about cemetery for the Rangers. Is there a, a yes. specific there's cemetery? Yes, there's a question in the chat. Uh, Texas Country Reporter did a, a show uh, two or three years ago about 
a cemetery in South Texas, which has many rangers buried there. Um, I don't know anything about that. Is there a Texas Ranger Cemetery or are they just dispersed across? The state? Um, so there is not an official one. Um, I know there are a couple of places that there are quite a few Rangers buried because they stayed in the same area as their captains or retired in that area. Um, then, of course, some of the more famous ones are in the, though, do not ask me their names because they just all flew out of my head, but some of them are buried in the uh, state cemetery. But there is no official Ranger Cemetery. And so the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame highlights some of the leading rangers through the years, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, families like Frank, Frank Hamer, there are quite a few Hamers in the Rangers. Um, we actually just inducted a few new members to the Hall of Fame in honor of the Bicentennial, um, including uh, rangers like Pete Rogers, who was one of the rangers that really brought airplanes um, into use for the very first time. Um, uh, Homer Garrison was the first leader of DPS um, under the Rangers, or second. He was uh, very important and helped bring them into modernity for the 1930s, as well as for the first time ever, two living Texas Rangers. Um, Johnny Acock and, oh my gosh, his name just flew out of my head. That is awful. But another really amazing Ranger who uh, pioneered some of the forensic stuff that they started um, and continue to do and many, many more that I could spend all day talking about. John Martin, that's his name. That's me. I've got another question. May I jump in here again? Fire away. You're it. Uh, so um, I know there's a lot of legacy in the Rangers in terms of families serving one after the other. We have a, a Alfred Ali's collection here that he gave to the museum in the 80s. I know he's a bit of a controversial character. Could you speak to that and also about the legacy that his grandfather, his father, he and then his son all served in the Rangers? I don't know the details um, about him specifically. I do know his family's been in the Rangers for a long time. And they did, a you know, a, definitely that's a name I know. But I'll be honest with you, I don't know that one specifically. Um, currently serving, we do have um, a, a Ranger named Travis Dendy. And he is a third generation Texas Ranger, which is one of the only ones in modern Texas Ranger history. Um, his father was the chief of the Rangers and his grandfather was a highly ranked Ranger as well. So that's the Dendy family. That's one that I know. And there's also a family in the early Rangers as that was the White family, but I do not remember all of their names, I'll be honest. Y'all have helped me with your archives in terms of Rangers, because there's always, oh yes, my so-and-so was in the Rangers and your archives was always helpful. And you helped us identify a Ranger badge that we have here at the Cowboy Museum uh, carried by Martin Trejo, who was a, a Hispanic Ranger in the mid thirties. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about your archives and, and your public service part? Yes, I'd be happy to. So we do have the Armstrong Research Center, uh, which is connected to the museum and is a part of the museum. Um, and they have an incredible amount of documents and history. Um, we have the what is the closest thing to a full list of Texas Rangers. Um, there are times where records were not well kept or were lost, um, but we do have the closest thing to a full roster of Texas Rangers. And um, you can re uh, research with them. You can put in a research request. And all of that information is on our website, which I will be happy to put in the chat real quick. Um, and if you go there and go to research a Texas Ranger, it has all of that information in there. And I swear the two people that work in the archives have forgotten more about Texas Ranger history than I will ever know. <laughs> Audrey, how did Waco come to be the place where the museum was located? Um, so part of that is Waco is pretty centrally located. Um, we're kind of in the middle of the state. We're um, along the I-35 corridor between um, DFW and Austin. Um, and when they were looking for a museum to kind of highlight and put on the I-35 corridor, um, there was a ranger camp called Fort Fisher um, somewhere along the Brazos. Um, and so that's part of the reason our location was chosen. And of course, we are also the headquarters for Company F, which was already stationed in Waco. Um, so that was another kind of good place to put us. That way we kind of could talk to Company F and make sure we're up to date on all things ranger. 
And of course, we're thrilled that it, it is along the historic route of the Chisholm Trail. So of course. Glad to highlight that. Any other questions? Would you would you mind uh, talking about your relationship with the Ranger Museum in San Antonio? Um, we are separate institutions. I mean, Fred, and, and there's one in Fredericksburg too. Yes, uh, the two of those were separate institutions. Um, I there's not much of a relationship there. Uh, I visited both places; they're pretty cool. I'm biased. I think we're the best. Um, <laughs> but yes, we are separate institutions. Thank you. Well, Texas is such a huge state. <laughs> Yes, yes, we are. Huge, huge history. Any other questions? So we have the, uh, in the chat, there is a link, texasranger.org. And we know that museum is open seven days a week, my goodness. Yes. Uh, want to add it to uh, our, our bucket list and we look forward to to visiting. Another big round of applause for Audrey. Uh, terrific. Audrey, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I was it was a pleasure. Thank you all. Fantastic audience. Great questions too. Great job, Audrey. Well thanks uh folks. Uh this concludes our, our August session. Um we'll have an announcement or two to follow. Lonnie, uh what's ahead? Uh what's up next month for Cattle Trail Shows? Well if we get Dennis prepared, I think September Dennis is going to talk to us about what's going to be happening in Ellsworth. So we'll be ready. That's okay. a tall that's a tall order, man. <laughs> not with not with your help. <clears throat> and we may so we may all have to help kind of chime in on that one, I guess. I'm I'm on sabbatical. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just put in the chat a link to where you can register for the, the uh, 2023 Chisholm Trail Conference. So pleased that that website is updated. And Dennis Katzemeyer, our ICTA president, will be talking about the 2023 conference on our next month's edition of Cattle Trails Showcase. I am so excited. We have R.W. Hampton, the performer, uh, performing that uh, that evening. Uh, uh, Joel McRae's grandson, Wyatt McRae, uh, Hollywood star, uh, will be part of it. Ken Spurgeon, the producer of the new movie, Sodden Stubble. Um, folks from our own ranks. Uh, and then that's on Friday, October 20. The 21st then is uh, all day activities uh, uh, there in Ellsworth, uh, the Drovers uh, Activities Symposium, uh, uh, the Tallgrass Express String Band will be performing, the Little Kids Rodeo. There is a host of activities going on in Ellsworth to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Ellsworth Cutoff, the Cox Cutoff of the Chisholm Trail. And so uh, uh, you can get registered, find information, um, on that, that link that we placed in the chat. So uh, we look forward to, to that and look forward to our, uh, it will be uh, the second Friday, Friday, September 8th, will be our next Cattle Trails Showcase. And, and be sure and mark your calendars for the, the conference in Ellsworth, October 19 to 23 to 22. So to close our program today, this is Ron Wilson, Poet Larratt saying, thanks for taking time to join us in this place. And come on back next month for our Cattle Trails Showcase. Happy trails, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, Audrey.